guys, today I want to do something a little bit different. I am actually doing Vlogist right now, so I've been uploading a video every single day, which is usually a daily vlog, but I'm actually replacing a couple of them with kind of sit down and chat videos. So that's what we're doing today. But this one, I don't really know if it's gonna be like funny or if it's gonna be informative, but let's just go for it. I want to react and comment on my number one most popular video. So I put up this video while I was living in Nanjing and it was one of the very first videos I ever filmed, ever uploaded, and it's called What Is China Really Like? It's gotten to the point where if you search What Is China Like on YouTube, my video pops up. And it is currently at 43,796 views. That's a lot of views. It's my number one most viewed video. But the weird thing about it is that it is actually very old. I haven't seen it in at least a year and the video itself is about a year and a half old. I actually filmed it after I had been living in China for about three months. But the reason I wanted to react and comment on this video is just because I still get comments on this video to this day. I get new subscribers, some of you may have found my channel through this video, and I get comments from people saying things that I completely agree with, but at the time that I filmed the video, I didn't really understand and I didn't really feel that way, just because I was so new to China. And this all happened last year, and as the year progressed, I went to Hong Kong, Thailand, Cambodia, a more rural town just outside Outside Nanjing, well it's maybe like an hour away from Nanjing, to Shanghai, and then later we moved to Beijing. So this video was filmed before any of that travel experience happened, so I was pretty fresh in the China world, which is why I don't know if this is going to be me like correcting my video or if this is going to be me just reacting and kind of cringing out over this video. Let's see what happens. I wanted to talk to you about the main question I get from friends and family, which is, what is it like? to be in China. Okay, <laughs> my talking speed is so much slower and like sweeter sounding than like what I normally sound like on vlogs now. I was just not very comfortable in front of the camera. I was missing you so much when I filmed this video. Oh my goodness. Whenever I heard a little kid wearing squeaky shoes, I cried. Before I came here, all I really knew was that there's pollution. Everyone here speaks a little bit of English. That is so not true. They eat dog meat. <laughs> Oh, that's why I still get comments about people being like, Chinese people don't eat dog meat. I don't think they understood. That was my impression of China before China. That was really all I knew. I was like, oh, everyone around the world speaks English, right? Like, of course, everyone in China speaks English. No, that's not true. If you're going to China soon, no. Like, I was told everyone's going to want to practice their English with you. Not from my experience in China. I was trying to speak what little Chinese I could, and then they were speaking, like, fluent Chinese back at me. But it was pretty rare that someone would try to speak like a small amount of English to me. It was either like all or nothing. <laughs> and for the record, I am fully aware that the majority of China does not eat dog meat and actually does not approve of dog meat. They eat lots of rice. Chinese people love the color red. <laughs> That is so random. These things that I bring up in the beginning are so weird. And the reason they sound so strange is because the point of that whole little spiel that I did right here is that I hardly knew anything about China before I went, but I did know how to order a beer. So first impressions when I came to China, the driving here looks terrifying. This is before I was really like super comfortable biking around cars. Once I got to Beijing, it was like a boom, I was over it. I just became way more comfortable biking. I actually I have a video all about how to bike in China if you are going to China soon. I'll have it linked in the iCards up above. Everyone is Chinese. I can't hide and they're all staring at me. <laughs> Chinese people seem way more accommodating to foreigners compared to Americans. Preach, sister! Oh my god, I figured out so quickly how accommodating Chinese people can be towards foreigners. I went to China with the impression that Chinese people were rude. I was told that Chinese people come across as rude and they may be rude to me because I'm American, because I'm white, for whatever reason. That was not the case at all. Most of the people, like 99.99% .99 of the people, I had any kind of little interaction with them, they were very kind. Um, at the most, people just stared and almost like over the top kind, like why are you being so nice to me kind of kind. It was... Chinese people are very, very kind to foreigners and are much more accommodating to foreigners than we are here in America. Now that I've lived here for three months, I've learned a lot. And after I lived in China for another seven months, I've learned a lot. First of all, people in China are so nice. Seriously, they're so welcoming. If you just come here as a tourist and you don't speak Chinese, and just FYI, I don't speak Chinese, um, but if you're here just for a couple of days or a week, you might not get to experience how nice and how welcoming people are 
But the second they see you more than, you know, a few times, like the people around our neighborhood, they become so welcoming. Just as an example, there's a stationery store down the street. <laughs> I know this story. A ton of the comments on this video are people being like, that doesn't mean do you want to eat something? I know, but in this particular situation, which is just illustrating how freaking nice people are in China, all I'm saying is that she actually did offer me food and I was very moved by it. Trust me, she wasn't just asking how are you, she was definitely asking if I wanted some food. <laughs> Second of all, I feel like people here seem to be more okay living in slightly uncomfortable situations. This I actually have a whole different perspective on. So in the video I was like, people are more okay with being uncomfortable. There's a lot of reasons for why I made that kind of a statement. The main one was just that our mattress in Nanjing was so freaking hard. And I was like, how does anyone sleep on this? I don't understand. And it was just this thing that I hadn't like let go of. And also the pillows were like super lumpy because they were made with, um, oh, Oh crap, what is it? Dang it, I know what it is. Um, a feeling that they use in pillows that makes them like, uh, kind of like mold to your head or whatever. I found it extremely uncomfortable and I hated all pillows that had any of it in there. Buckwheat, that's what it was. Oh, and like not having the elevator in the apartment or whatever. So I was like, why are these old people who live like across from us sleeping on, on like a tiny mattress, walking up all these stairs, like what the heck? And the thing with the bed and the thing with stairs and a lot of these is not that people are like, oh, it's uncomfortable, but whatever. It's more that this is better for my health. That's what the main thing is from what I gathered. Hard mattresses are actually better for your back. Chinese people are all about health, especially the older Chinese people. And that's really what it came down to is a lot of these like uncomfortable things that were uncomfortable to me were either just like the norm and that's just the way it is or it was something related to health. However, I still don't understand those tiny stools that they sit on. Why are they so tiny? They're like this tall. Why don't you just sit on the ground at that point? I sit on the ground all the time. I don't know. Anyways, rant over. The outside of apartment buildings and the entrances to apartment buildings are sometimes, well, a lot of the times, it looks like total squalor on the outside. For many of these apartment buildings in China, there's no regulations on how maintained the outside of the building or the inside of the hallway area needs to look. So a lot of times it's just not kept up. It's just, that's how it is. It's really not like looked down upon. Like I don't think people in China would like feel ashamed bringing their parents to an apartment because the apartment building looked bad. I think the only part of the apartments that people actually care about is the space that they personally live in. Most Chinese apartments are actually much nicer looking than the building itself. And of course, the infamous uh, squatting toilets, which are essentially holes in the ground. I have an entire video about what the toilets in China are like. I'll have it linked up in the iCards, but it's kind of funny that I lumped the squatting toilets into this category as well. I actually don't remember doing this because the squatting toilets are totally for sanitation and for health. Squatting toilets actually are better for your health. When you go number two, it actually puts your body in a much better situation, which is better for digestion and for um, moving your bowels and stuff. But additionally, when you go into a squatting toilet, that you can actually get away with touching nothing, which is a lot more sanitary than touching the uh, toilet flush handle thingy and like putting your butt on the seat or whatever. Neighborhoods around here can be really noisy. Like when people are working, they'll just yell. They have megaphones. So the <laughs> when I said when people are working, they'll just yell. It's actually true. And it's actually part of like Chinese history, at least definitely in Nanjing. It's part of Chinese culture for the marketplaces to be like lively and loud and people will yell and like advertise their products by yelling at people. There would be people by here in the neighborhood with these megaphones and they'd be like blah, 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 and we had no idea what they were saying. It was very, very loud in Nanjing, like extremely loud. Beijing was much quieter and there are neighborhoods in Beijing, there are neighborhoods in Nanjing that are very quiet. It's just that the areas that we were in were particularly loud and rural China is obviously extremely quiet. It's like the country. So it's not like all of China is super loud, but America is definitely a lot quieter from my experience. I couldn't stand the level of quiet that my hometown was when I got back. Like I had to have music playing to fall asleep. My ears were like ringing because it was so quiet. <laughs> so yeah, I guess I would say like China's generally more loud. Like there's a lot of honking and yelling and stuff, but it's, it's not, as loud as I thought it was at the time of filming this video because I was living in the Nanjing apartment, which as I explained in my Nanjing apartment tour was an extremely loud neighborhood. There were too many children. People wear clothes that I would consider fall or winter clothes in like the heat of summer. People don't wear shorts. They don't wear tank tops. They're in like sweaters and jeans and it's like, 
80 degrees and a thousand percent humidity outside and I'm just like sweating in a sundress. Personally I found Chinese fashion to be a bit more modest than what I was used to. It's pretty rare to see women wearing shorts or be wearing dresses without tights. I'm trying to rack my brain to think on that a little harder. I think Nanjing was a little bit more conservative than Beijing. Like we definitely saw like more wild fashion in Beijing. You'll see people dressing in all kinds of ways but I found that when I wore shorts and a tank top or if I wore a sundress that was sleeveless with my knees showing I got a lot more looks than if I was just my normal white self fully clothed <laughs> but I actually think that this has a lot more to do with weather in Nanjing I think I wasn't very used to the weather um, this was March so for me it was hot but in Nanjing it hadn't even gotten close to the peak of summer yet so I think that I just wasn't used to the weather there's also a really obvious generation gap I'd say it differs a lot from the generation gap that I see in America the young and the old have different viewpoints on life. I think a lot of it has to do with globalization and I think globalization hit China a lot later than it hit America, which is why I felt that the generation gap between Chinese young and old was so much greater than the gap between myself and older people here in America. And China is a bit more of like a homogenous culture. The US is more of a melting pot and it's younger. The US is under 250 years old. China is like thousands of years old. So a lot of the older people in China are still holding on very strongly to Chinese traditions by way of marriage, raising your kids, what you do for a living, what you eat, all that kind of stuff. And then the younger people are, I got the feeling, starting to question things a bit more because of globalization, because of the internet. They're starting to look into more alternative lifestyles. The experience level that people have with foreigners, like between the age groups, and then also cutting in line. And I know that seems like a small thing, but think of how many lines you stand in in your life. The line cutting, uh, it's, a, it's a thing. It definitely is a thing. And it's mostly the old Ais in China, which is like the old women in China. That's usually who you have to fight in lines for. The main areas of China are a lot more like densely populated. So there is also this other factor that you see if you are here in the Bay Area, for example, where people are, it's a lot more competitive to just get places because if you don't compete, you might get like kind of left behind in the dust. But yeah, I definitely shoved a little bit from time to time because otherwise I wouldn't have been able to get off the subway or I never would have been able to buy that freaking bag of rice because I kept getting cut in line and also like the expectation for your family is a lot narrower I definitely got the feeling that uh, the expectation for younger people in China was much narrower than what it is in America like when I told my mom oh I'm quitting my job I'm going to China and I'm gonna be a blogger she was like okay if this is what you want and I feel like in China the parents would be like how could you do this to our family well, I'm not saying that's how everybody is. I'm just boiling it down to what I personally was able to witness while I was in China. Obviously, as I talk about this, I can't account for every single person in America. I can't account for every single person in China. I can only speak on my personal experiences. So definitely comment below if you had experiences different than me, because I, I want to hear about it for sure. You're pretty much expected to be married by the time you're 30. They actually call women who are 30 and unmarried, they call them leftover women. It's almost expected that you'll have two kids. I wouldn't say it's it's expected for you to have two kids I think it's more expected for you to just have one kid at least I actually did see like a crap load of pregnant people in China because one child policy was switched to a two child policy shortly before we got there and so they're just like everybody was pregnant promises versus expectations promises are always really really high like unnaturally preach unattainably high and then the expectation is normal mm-hmm mm. Yes, this was reaffirmed to me many times in China. On top of that, it is also very common for things to be promised to you that don't happen. Like here, let me give you an example. I was told that on the first day of the class that I was teaching that the students would bring in books and that they would bring in some like homework or whatever and we would work on that. They came in nothing. They were, I, they threw me in with nothing. And apparently that's very common in China. People come across as really creepy sometimes. <laughs> like relationships in China can be, can feel really creepy. <laughs> I was so obsessed with Fei Chang Lura at the time. Okay, it's kind of funny that I said people are creepy in China because I, I don't really feel that way anymore. And I don't know if it's just that I like grew to have like an innate understanding of like what to expect when I go out in public. I think I just had more of like a personal boundary than your average person does in China. I don't really 
really know. I think some things came across as creepy to me, but now having lived in China for longer than I did at the time I filmed this video, I don't actually think they were very creepy interactions. Dating in China though, I never experienced that. You'll have to go to Ling Ling's channel, that is youtube.com slash Lena around. I'll have a link down below. The people who are native to this land are still the ruling strong civilization that exists today. This is a really complex topic that I delved into really casually in this video. Um, yes, the native pe Han Chinese people are still living there and they are one of the native peoples that has lived in China for a very long time, but there are many, many other minority groups in China that are underrepresented and they are also native to that land that is China. But their populations have decreased some languages have been lost, some culture has been lost. It's a lot more complex topic than I think I realize. It's easier if you just look at Chinese culture as Han Chinese, but it becomes more complicated when you bring in these other cultures like Western China, for example. The language out there is actually more similar to a lot of Middle Eastern languages, but one China, one language. So I'm hands off when it comes to this topic. <laughs> But yeah, China is basically like a lot more diverse than I explained it as being in this video. It's a very, very diverse place. There's a lot going on. It's not as diverse as it used to be. That's the feeling I'm getting. I don't know. It's a really complex topic. I'll just, I'll end it there. The government takes a lot of precautions to protect Chinese people and Chinese culture and keep China like purely China. And there can be some ways that they do that that Americans find really truly offensive, so, like the way that they uh, censor the internet and censor books and censor movies and things like that. I'm making this face because I don't really want to get into this topic <laughs> because it's really complicated and it's not something I feel super like confident about discussing. But also if I look like I'm kind of laughing at the same time, it's because I can hear cats fighting in the background of this video. <laughs> there are a lot of stray cats that lived near our apartment in Nanjing. Oh my god, there's like two elementary schools, all these like kids toys that like play music out loud, people with megaphones, and like a crap load of stray cats. That was like just a, like a quadruple whammy. For me, China's lack of law when it comes to traffic was kind of alarming. <laughs> it's so funny that I'm so scared of the traffic in this video. I actually became like a lot more comfortable with it as time went on. It really just took practice is all it was. It took practice of biking in traffic, like next to cars, next to people, next to other bikers, scooters, all that stuff, to really get an idea of the way traffic flows in Chinese cities. From an American perspective, if you're looking at it for the first time, it, it is a little bit horrifying to see. It'll be like a three lane highway and there's like seven cars wide and you're like, where are the lanes? I don't know, nobody knows, no one cares. How is it that no one's getting in an accident right now? That's a question I ask myself a lot in China. The flow of traffic is just different, that's all it is. And it, it was scaring me because it was something I couldn't give up control of and later on I was able to kind of give up control and accept the way it was and just like become part of the flow of traffic and that's why I became less scary to me. At this point I was still like resisting it and I was just like, I don't understand, this doesn't make any sense, why? A lot of people don't wear seatbelts, a lot of people don't wear helmets. I don't fully agree with that still. I actually didn't wear a helmet at all when I biked in China and I rarely wore seatbelts when I was in the car, but now that I'm back in America I'm like, that was kind of dumb. I shouldn't have like given in to the way the like people around me were acting. Now if you're curious, in America I always wear my seatbelt, I always wear my helmet when I go biking. Oh, the other thing is that in China, there's a lot more like motorized scooters. So the traffic looks really different because of that. There's more motorized scooters and more people on bikes. Whereas in America, I'm used to like roads with cars and then occasionally you'll see a biker or a motorcyclist. In China, it's not like that at all. It's very common to see like all the different kinds of vehicles all cohabitating with each other. They'll honk really incessantly. The honking in China is actually kind of interesting because there's an old law in China that people don't really abide by, but it's a traffic law that says that you have to honk every single time you turn a corner. Lao I 86 talked about this in a video, but that's actually one of the reasons so many people have like adopted the like honking mechanism. But people in China also use their horn more as like a voice. Whereas in America, you're only supposed to use it if you're like angry. Like it has an angry tone. When I hear honking, I feel like someone's mad at me. But in China, it's not like that. I would be on a bike and someone would like tap their horn behind me and I would know that the car was there. So I know I, don't, I shouldn't make any sudden moves. And I appreciated the honking in China because it was just like a, hey, coming through. There's a book called Lost on Planet China. I'll link it down below. God, there's a lot of stuff I have to link down below apparently. The guy in that book, his whole segment on the way traffic looks in Beijing had me like cry laughing. 
laughing. Super funny. People in China, I feel like, realize how difficult their language is to learn if you're an English speaker because all the young people around here in school have to learn English, so they realize that how different the two languages are. So if you speak Chinese, they're super impressed. Every single time Eric pulled out his Chinese, the first sentence out of anybody's mouth was, oh, how the, like your Chinese is so good. But what I was saying about how like everybody in school has to learn English, yes, technically they have to take English class and they have to pass English exams. There's a lot of reasons that um, many, many people come out of the Chinese public school system not speaking any kind of conversational English. It's actually pretty common, but they do technically have to be in English classes. One thing I noticed really quickly is that Chinese people are such romantics. I don't know how much I even agree with this, to be honest anymore. Like Chinese people are romantics. I, I think it's just because I've been watching a lot of Fei Chang Rao. China has all kinds of people. Some people are romantic, some people aren't. Maybe there's aspects of Chinese culture that I could describe as romantic, but I don't think that they're like obsessed with dating shows or anything, not any more than America. But oh my God, there's so much crying in Chinese TV. That is something that you cannot deny. I do not think very many Chinese people have tasted dog meat. I kind of covered this already, but I don't personally think that dog meat is as common in China as the Western media wants to believe that it is. I never saw an advertisement for dog meat. I never saw an advertisement for the dog meat festival. What I did see was a lot of dogs that were pets of people in China. Pollution in China is really just in the major cities. Um, I'm in Nanjing. I don't think I had a full view of what pollution is really like in China until I moved to Beijing. And if you want to know more about that, hopefully I have room left in the iCards to put it up there. But if not, I'll have it linked down below. I made a video about the pollution in Beijing, my thoughts on it. Basically, the gist of it is, if you don't have time to go watch that video, is that it's not as bad as the Western media portrays it, but it is bad. It feels like Chinese people are a lot more in touch with their history and with their ancient culture. I think it's just that there's more of the culture and more of the history because China is thousands of years old versus my home country, which is only a couple hundred years old. I actually studied Native American culture when I was in college because I was so fascinated by ancient cultures, and that's really the only one we have in America, and we kind of like screwed that up a long time ago. Yeah, that's a topic for another video. I can definitely make one if you guys are interested. I feel fairly knowledgeable on Native American cultures. Overall, when I'm looking at China through an American filter, I realize that China and the US have way more similarities than differences. Preach! It's not that scary here. So true! China is not as scary as the Western media portrays it to be, and China and America have a lot more in common than they have different. The scariest part of living in China is not being able to speak the language. I should make kind of an update on just generally like, what is it like to not speak Chinese and live in China? I should definitely make a video on that soon. I have a video that I made called The Lazy Girl's Guide to Mandarin, which is just like survival language skills for getting around China, which is pretty much the majority of my Chinese language skills. <laughs> but there's a lot more I could say on the topic because that's definitely the scariest part of being in China is just not speaking the language. But it should make you feel a little bit more comfortable that Chinese people are more accommodating to people who don't speak their language compared to the way we as Americans treat people who don't speak the language here. Anyways, I'm gonna get off my soapbox I hope you guys enjoyed this video. I'm glad I was able to kind of clarify some stuff. So I will see you tomorrow. Thank you so much for watching. Okay, bye!